Okay, I'm sorry for the uh, delayed start today. Things didn't work and I got distracted in talking about other stuff and, and such is life. Um, today we're going to continue with our last day in InDesign or in Illustrator for now. We will come back to Illustrator in a little bit. And I conclude today with kind of the, the collection of things that I think you need to know that we haven't covered yet. Um, but I think the best way of explaining that is through a discussion of architectural diagrams. And for those of you industrial design students, this isn't quite as relevant to what you're doing, though quick sketching and the, the techniques that I'll show you in Illustrator will certainly benefit you in terms of being able to color code and, and draw quickly and, and that sort of thing. But this is really meant for the architectural designers out there because we have to find a way to represent our ideas quickly and easily, and we can do that through Illustrator uh, but I'm going to show you a bunch of examples and talk through what diagrams are and that sort of thing. Essentially, what an architectural diagram is, is it's a way of explaining a major design idea. So you guys in studio, you're in 121, you're doing the Mondrian Museum or something along those lines. Are you doing that right now? Soon. Soon. You haven't even gotten there yet? See. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, you've got a lot of work left to do. Anyway, when you... When you get to that point, you're going to be responsible for coming up with the design, obviously. And when you come up with that design, you're going to have to be able to explain it to somebody in a really clear and concise manner. And the easiest way, or the way that architects tend to do this, is through something called a diagram. And as you learn to diagram, as you learn to figure this process out, uh, try working in a sketchbook. Sketches are essentially very, very close to diagrams. And you can get used to practicing your diagramming in a sketchbook easily. Uh, you can always try adding color. You can cut out images and paste them together. Collage tends to work really well. Sometimes just changing from a pen to a pencil. You don't even have to have color. Just changing medium can make uh, a really big difference. If you like to watercolor, you could watercolor, for example. Um, that can help as well. And the thing about sketchbooks or diagrams or whatever is they don't always have to happen in your sketchbook in the right place at the right time. So this is a sketchbook from grad school. This was my uh, sketchbook first semester in grad school. Uh, and this happened to be a page, and it's a pretty good example, of a bunch of diagramming that happened that didn't happen when I had my sketchbook around. So uh, that's a piece of, the first thing here is a piece of trace. There's a few pieces of paper. You can see some of these had drawings on the back sides of them. Um, we actually went out to dinner, and some of these happened at dinner as I was scribbling. And I needed a place to collect them. So I grabbed them all, and I stuck them into my sketchbook with tape. So there's nothing wrong with that as a strategy. So when it, when it strikes you, when you feel like you need to get these ideas out, that's when you get them out. And then stick them in your sketchbook later. But just have a pencil in hand, be able to draw. As I moved on in grad school, I found that I really like these style sketchbooks a little bit better. Uh, it's a Japanese fold, so it's one long continuous sheet of paper that's folded up inside the book. And it's also a little bit smaller, so I could carry it in my pocket. And so I did a lot of those kinds of drawings and, and diagramming inside of a book like this. So let's look specifically at diagram types and also examples of these types. And I think it's important when I talk about this, and I'll go through what these are in just a second, that diagrams don't always fall neatly into one category. So I've tried to divide these up into categories so you can see them as categories and understand them as categories, but a lot of times they overlap. So you might have a figure ground study with some arrows and flow lines over the top of it. So it doesn't neatly fit in just figure ground or just neatly fit in arrows and flow lines. They can bridge the gap. So you can use all of these together, but it's easier to talk about them separately. So we're going to go through what these are, figure ground, highlighting, arrows and flow lines, components, text, and movement. So we'll start with the figure ground, which I think is one of the very, very common ones. It's an old technique that still rings true today. It's very easy to use. It's essentially a way of creating a strong graphic contrast in your diagram. So one thing is, is dark, one thing is light. And that represents or accentuates a strong physical contrast in the building that you're designing. Something is public, something is private. Right? Something is dark, something is light. It's, it's, a, it's a strong contrast. It's called a figure ground or a solid and void diagram. So if we go back in history to John Battista Noli's plan of Rome in 1748, anybody seen this before? Maybe? Maybe in history you saw this? 
This is a plan of Rome. And essentially, we see Rome here. Let me blow up a section because this version is obviously too, too small for you to see any detail. So as we look at this plan of Rome, certainly there's labels on the plan of Rome. We can see Piazza del Popolo right up here uh, as part of it. And we can see the, tree, the streets and that sort of thing. But what do we see in terms of solid and void? There's white areas and there's black areas. And those two things represent two different things. What do you think they are? Negative and positive space, open. You're on the right track. Public and private space. So if we look at this plan, obviously the streets are public. Anybody can walk on the streets, no problem. Okay? But what else, what, it, oh, what is Rome full of? Churches. You can't go a block without finding a church in Rome. So the insides of churches are all public space. You can go into any church, you can walk right in. So as we look at this plan of Rome, you can see plans of churches because they're public space. So we see streets, we see churches, we see plazas, we see all those public spaces. The houses, the private spaces, are shown in black. So this is representative of the city of Rome. It's not actually a plan of Rome. It's a plan of the public and private space of Rome. So the things that are white, we can inhabit. The things that are, are black, we cannot, Okay, because they belong to somebody. So it's a really interesting way of looking at a particular diagram. This technique is used today very frequently. So here's a museum. Example of just uh, you know placards in a museum. What's where? Right? It could be in the brochure of the museum. We look at this. Level one, there's a lot of white space. But there's also this kind of light bluish space. The light blue space doesn't have any labels on it. We don't know what's going on in the light blue space. But we, we assume that it's space we can't access or we don't go to because it's shown as this, this darkish color. We get up to level two, level three, there's more space that's that light blue color that's not accessible to the public. And video games. It's the same kind of thing in video games, right? A little map in the corner. Mm -hmm. Where there's just the space that doesn't exist, right? So here we go. We're going to Rem Coolhouse's Office of Metropolitan Architecture. This is a library design that we did. It's a competition, or that they did. It's a competition. Here's a little model of it. Looks like a 3D print. It's not. And this was about the solid and the void inside of the library. So what were the stacks? What was the density? What was the storage of material versus the places you could access the material? So imagine a bunch of bookcases stacked up. You go into the, the stacks where all the books are. You get the, the book that you want to read, and you go to a place that's open that you can read it. So we could show this in diagrammatic form. And they did it in two ways. One was in section. These drawings are in section, so we've sliced through the building, and we're seeing it vertically. The white space, again, is the voids. It's the place we go to read. It's the place where the circulation desk is. Those kinds of things are in these voids. The place where the books or the media are stored is the black area. So it's really easy to see what's happening. We switch here into the plan view. We can see where the stacks are, and we can see where the open areas are that we can access the books and read and do that sort of thing. So it's a really good way of showing what this building is fundamentally about. It's about the density of the storage versus the open space that we can inhabit and access that storage. Just through this diagram, we can learn that. Another example, uh, this is from a book called The Endless City. It does a bunch of analyses of cities here. And it doesn't really matter what we're analyzing, but we've got a bunch of different cities, and we've got these darker or lighter regions representing certain features of that particular city. Examples here. I thought this one was particularly fun. You've got the cities, and then they reorganized the parts of the cities. So you took the parts apart and reorganized them. It's kind of fun. It's just an interesting way of looking at it, but it's fundamentally diagrammatic. So let's move on to highlighting. And some of these are rather obvious. Highlighting should be rather obvious to you as well. Basically, the point here is we're highlighting differences within the design framework. So the last one was about solid and void. It was about a big physical contrast inside the beginning. This is about, here's something specific. Point your attention at this one specific thing. It can be done in model, and it can be done in drawing. And sometimes the easiest way of referring to this is color coding something. 
We put some color on it. Look, look here. This is what's happening here. So let's see some examples of this. So here we have an old building and a new building together. And we've got various floors that have access. The old building shown in yellow, the new building shown in red. This, these are areas that are pointing out because it's something's going on relating to this particular building. It doesn't really matter what's happening here or why the design decisions are made. We can tell that something's happening on these two floors. Another example here of a building, they're trying to show here what various functions go in the building. We have separate drawings. The office portion is this light blue. The business support is the uh, orange color. Then we have green for the welfare facility. You get the idea. This is where certain things belong in the building. This is diagrammatic. So this is from Alex Holgreff. You guys saw a bunch of his portfolio stuff. I think his graphics are great. They're really strong, and they should be inspiring to you. Uh, as well as they are to me. Here's an example of uh, a diagram that he did relating to the building. His building is right here in the center. Sorry, my, my highlight is in red, and of course it's on a red background. But essentially what he's saying is, I've split this building through the middle based on these two views. So if we look at the two views, right, and we stand here and we're looking this way, oh, come on. Right, and we're looking this way, we're getting a view of these things down at the bottom. If we stand here and we're looking that way, we get a view of those things. And there we have the two views on either side that are showing the same diagram. So it's this combination of the two pictures that really allow us to see what's happening to the building and the little slices in the building that are allowing this view corridor to happen. Another example here, same building. This one's just about what view is from a particular location. So we have a, uh, this kind of colored swatch going out to each of the directions of the building, and then we're coupling with the view at the bottom that represents. So it's just the diagram that's telling us this is where the view is. It's color coded as this, and here's the view where we can actually see it in perspective. Another example here of color coding, different elements of the building put together. And what those elements represent, obviously they're different. I don't know this building, so I can't tell you exactly what's happening here. But we understand that there are three different elements, and those elements are overlapping. This one's a little bit much. It's kind of like a, a rainbow decided to throw up all over the drawing or something. But it still functions fine. And it certainly works as, quote, color coding. But in here, we have the various functions that are coded out in different colors. We have a key along the side that represents what all those colors are. And it's pretty easy to understand that, oh, there's a theater, and that's colored purple. The uh, supporting retail space is all colored in red. And we can understand what's happening really quickly. It might be easier if we took this drawing and we separated it out. So there was maybe six or seven drawings, and we color coded just one piece of the drawing, as opposed to combining it all together. That would help with this overwhelming color rainbow going on. Another example here with color coding, we have our plan, and we have different areas that are coded in red, different areas that are coded in blue. Again, I'm not familiar with this project, so I couldn't tell you what they represent. But we understand that there's a difference between the red areas, the blue areas, and the white areas. There is some fundamental difference that would be relevant to the project. Another example here, we have a red area and we have a blue area. I'm guessing the blue area is a river or, or some kind of a natural, natural, <laughs> I can't even talk a natural area. The red area is probably like a city or some density. And we're showing a contrast between the density of that city and the natural environment. And we're building in between the two to create that void. And that happens to be shown in white. Another example here, where we have kind of the line work drawing. And then we start to color code it. In this first example here, we show the terraces. As we move forward, we see, oh, there's parking. There's the core building services. We've got some commercial scattered in here. We've got offices. Then we've got housing. We've got a hotel and a restaurant. And they're all coming together as this building. So this is an example where we have the color coding, but they're spread out over a series of drawings. And just by spreading it out, it makes it a little bit more clear. You guys remember back to that drawing of the theater that had all the colors on it? It was, it was more confusing to see. This is really easy to see. We see really quickly what's happening in each view. Diagrams should fundamentally be simple. It's kind of like telling a one-line joke. Right? There's not a lot to it. You just get to the punchline. There it is. Diagrams should be like that. We get to the point. It's really clear, really simple. 
Another example here where they start to combine together. Uh, this particular building had to do with changing these modules based on what market conditions were saying. So the idea was that they could move. So they're showing different uh, conditions here, stronger market for housing, stronger market for offices, stronger market for the commercial program, et cetera. So you're seeing an adaptation. Another example here of Alex Holgreff's work, you can kind of see his style when I show these uh, images. Same kinds of things where we're color coding specific components or pieces of the building. Those change in each view. And we see those highlighted in red as we go forward, and he's highlighting those particular components of the building. This would probably be paired with some text or something like that. Arrows or flow lines accentuate movement through a building or a strong idea about something. So this is a good example over here on the right where we have this particular building. Notice just it doesn't even have an arrow on it, but if we look at that red line that's going through, I'm not going to trace over the top of it because then you can't see it, but if we look at that red line right there, notice that it starts out thick, and as we enter the building, there's a piece of it that branches off and goes down. That's representing the number of people that are walking into the building. So there's a, a group of them that are branching off and going down, but the bulk of people continue straight and they move up to that first tier, and then some more people branch off. And then they continue their way up, and you see that that line gets smaller. So it's telling us information about how people move through the space. That's what these arrows are really good at showing, movement through space. OK, floating roof house. So these happen to be some of my favorite architects. Okay? So they have a house, and I really like this house. And it's called the floating roof house. All I gave you on this right here is a blank slide, and it says the floating roof house. So if you, right now, had to diagram a floating roof house, what would you draw? Would it be a boat? No, but think about trying to draw this and spend a little bit of time. And actually, if you have a piece of paper or a pen or something, try to draw it. What would it be? You know, maybe you'd, you know, in the most generic sense, whoops. You're not supposed to see it yet. In the most generic sense, maybe it's, you know, oh, I have a house and the roof is above. It's floating. I don't know. Maybe it's something like this and maybe I'm going to say, no, the roof needs to go up and it's like that. I don't know. But you have to think about how do you diagram something like this and if it's based on something like floating roof house, you have to figure out how to show that idea. That floating roof house is the key part of this whole design. It's the key idea. So when we flip to the next one, which I already accidentally flipped to, right? we see his actual diagram of the floating roof house. So what he drew in here is he drew a hillside, and there's some kind of a little roof that's floating. And in order to accentuate the fact that that roof is floating, he drew an arrow that goes through it. So the idea is that you can move through, or the hillside moves through this house because the roof floats. Cool concept, right? So let's make it a little bit more technical. We move forward into the actual more technical drawing, and we start to see, oh, OK, we have this hillside, and we have a little flat area on the hillside, and the, the, the house somehow has this really cantilevered roof that lets it kind of float out there. This is a really cool perspective drawing. This, um, these guys, Takaharu and Yui Tezuka, they're Japanese architects. This house is in Japan. When I was in grad school, they were visiting um, professors. They came over and taught a, a studio. And it was one of the best studios I was ever in. They were absolutely fantastic. Um, he is amazing at drawing. And he would sit there while we'd be presenting, and he'd be drawing the entire time. He'd be drawing on his coffee cup. He'd be drawing what all our faces' reactions were. He was just sitting there drawing. And he would leave behind this scattered mess of drawings when he left. And it was just his way of expressing his ideas. So these kinds of drawings are very representative of him and their ideas. So let me flip forward so you can see an actual view of the house. So this is the floating roof house. There's that hillside that we were talking about. The roof essentially floats out there. There are no main walls anywhere on the exterior of the building. They're all doors that push open. There's a few core walls that support in the inside of the, of the building itself. But really, the house is about the idea that this roof floats. It extends out. The eaves extend out. And so when you see it in its actual photographic form, you can understand that this 
started from an idea. It started from that diagram of the hillside flowing through the house, and it ended up materializing into this particular building. Another example here, I have no idea what this project is, but we've got some kind of a building and we've got these little red modules that obviously because of the color of red, we're drawing our attention to those modules and they must have some connection to something that's off the page. Those white lines represent that connection. Another example here where we have different um, things happening across a central plaza and what are those central, uh, what do those lines start to represent in the design itself? Another example here of a plaza with the views out from that particular plaza. Sometimes the arrows represent air movement. It doesn't have to be people movement through a space. In this case, it has to do with how air is traveling through a particular building and or cooling that building. I have a few discrepancies with this particular drawing. Um, I think unless you had a really strong prevailing wind that was pushing air through the building and out that way, in reality, the air is going to do this because of the hot cold. Cold air comes in the bottom, comes up, and goes out the top. It very rarely does that across the room. That's why double hung windows are so great, because you can open the bottom and the top. Hot air rises, and it naturally goes out. It's a better way of cooling. So anyway, that has nothing to do with anything you're doing today. I just wanted to point that out, because maybe someday you'll be sitting in studio, and it'll pop back in your head. Oh. If I put a window higher and a window lower, you'll get stack cooling effect. Anyway, sorry, I can't help myself. Sometimes you want to emphasize components of a building or certain pieces of a building. You want to draw attention to something specific. Usually this is done in an axonometric or an exploded axonometric. So the easy way of thinking about this is I have my building, it's kind of 3D, and I pull off the face, or I raise up the top, or I lift the roof. And that way, I can see what's happening inside the building. I'm breaking it apart into its little component pieces. And sometimes you're showing structure, mechanical systems, or something that's important about the building itself. I love this drawing, but it unfortunately shows up a little bit light on the projector. Um, essentially, you've got this core of the building with this big open space on top, and you've got a skin that wraps all the way around the building. So in this in this example, it's a nice 3D rendering. They took that skin and they just lifted it right up. So we can kind of see what's happening inside the building. We see that component drawing. It helps a lot that they have this little red line that runs up because it tells us that the two parts are connected and that they were broken apart. So when you do these kinds of axonometrics, you want to make sure that you show that uh, in action. Example of a, a structural diagram and a structural model. Uh, where you have little pieces, like I said, axonometric, that show skin versus structure or, or that sort of thing. So this is the Sendai MediaTek by Toyo Ito. This is his diagram relating to the building. So some of you might be able to read Japanese. I can't. So I can't tell you what any of this stuff says. But I can tell you just by looking at this and analyzing this diagram that this particular building has something to do with multiple floors and these twisting mesh-like things that go between the floors. So I, even though I don't see the building, I'm not seeing any component of the building, even though I can't read the language of what's actually written here, I have an understanding of what the building's about because the diagram is simple enough to understand. Does anybody actually speak Japanese in here? No? OK. A little like DNA too. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. I was going to ask you to actually read it because I have no idea what it was said. So we flip back. Remember I told you about that solid void thing in the very beginning, Noli's Plan of Rome? Same building, another set of diagrams. So we used the, the first one that we saw to analyze those components. Second one here, we see all the plans, and we see something that's really dense versus something that's open. So this has to do with storing materials. It happens to be a media library. So storing dense materials versus the places you can go to watch the materials. Moving forward to a, a little bit more technical drawing, this is still a diagram form. We have our floor plates, we have our skin, and we have these mesh tubes that go through it. Anybody seen this building before? No? So I'm building it up. That's good. That's good. You haven't seen it. So now we get to flip to the actual, oh, not quite yet, a little bit more structural analysis of these pieces. Then we flip to the actual building. So 
This is your building. This is the ground floor of the building. I'll show you a picture. Well, let me flip to the picture of the outside, and then we'll come back to this one in just a second. There's the outside. So there's the floors that go up through the building. And here's these mesh structures that come up through the building as well. So the diagram is exactly what the building is about. That's what it's showing us. That's why we do the diagram in the first place. So these happen to be really cool. So the idea behind here in this particular building was that all of the mechanical systems and all of the movement and the stairs and everything would happen inside of these twisting columns. So everything that's moving in and out of the building or going between floors happens there. Furthermore, these columns were the structure of the building. So they're going to hold up the building as well. So it was about these mesh depressions going through uh, the building. And if we look carefully at it, in this one on the left here, and I'll draw so that I'm not pointing there, this one right here, you can clearly see the stairwell going up through. Right, right. Actually, the, the structure, I've seen some pictures of the construction on this and how the, the steel worked to make these things happen and not fall down. It's pretty impressive. Anyway, this middle one here, right, we have like mechanical systems. There's a pipe going up through there. It's probably the sprinkler lines or something like that. But that's what it's about. We come over to this next one, and there's the elevator core that's going up and down through the building. So interesting side note about this, it has nothing to do with, uh, with your diagramming for right now, but interesting side note about this building is notice that the, the one on the left here is the fire stairs, right? The stairs, you have to be able to get out of the building if there's a fire. Notice also, though, that the stairs are surrounded by a glass wall. So let's assume that you're on the sixth floor of the building, and there's a fire on the third floor of the building, and you have to get out. Okay, so you have to walk down past the third floor, which has glass walls through the stairwell to get out. So you as the designer, you're coming up with this design. You have to figure out how do you, how do you deal with that? How do you solve that problem? And so there's, there's two things. One, there's the panic of you have to walk by the fire that's raging on the outside of the glass. So you visually would be seeing it. That's a problem. And two, you have to deal with the fact that the glass would be really hot if you were to touch it. So two problems. So what they did to solve this, and this is a materials sort of thing, but it's interesting nonetheless, is they made a special kind of glass. And in the inside of the two panes of glass is something called an intumescent gel. And you can look it up online. You can look up intumescent paint or intumescent gel. In this case, it's a gel that resists heat and resists fire. So one side of the glass could be next to the fire. The other side of the glass would be cool. It's really cool technology stuff. The architect, Toyo Ito, had the choice to leave this chemical gel clear during a fire, or it could change its nature and turn opaque. So in the interest of solving, so we solved the heat, but in the interest of solving the panic, the gel that's in this building would actually turn opaque when it was exposed to flame. Pretty cool stuff. I would encourage you to look up this intumescent stuff. They have, they have examples online where you can see it, where it's just paint. It's not the gel. It's just paint. And they paint like a plywood wall, and then they put a blowtorch against it. And you can watch it, how quickly it'll burn the, the, through the plywood versus the intumescent paint. It won't burn through the plywood. It's really cool. It's only paint. That's it. It's really cool. So we have, we're in a great age where we can do stuff like this, which is fun. That has nothing to do with this class. I used to teach the materials class, so I love this stuff. But anyway, I don't get to teach it anymore. So you got five minutes of material lecture. So there it is from the outside with those twisting structures through it. Really, really cool building. Another example here of a structural diagram where the forces are on this particular uh, mesh. Here's another exploded axonometric where they've taken the building apart and they've blown the pieces apart. I think this could benefit from a little bit of color coding. Probably wouldn't hurt. Another example here, this one does have some color coding. Jewels inside the box, highlighting the jewels versus the rest of the building. This is a diagrid, structural diagram of what's happening outside the building. Heating and cooling diagram doesn't show quite as well here. Stack cooling effect, cold air comes in the bottom, goes out the top. Anybody been to the Pantheon before? Outside of it, and you didn't go in? Oh, OK. So you guys all have homework. I know you can't go there now, and you can't go there this semester. But this absolutely should be on your list of places to visit. Okay? Rome is an incredible city. It's worth going to Rome anyway. But 
this particular building is unreal. It's not, it's one of the things that we don't understand here in the US, or at least here on the West Coast, is how big buildings can be, right? Our buildings are small. This building is massive, okay? So this was built in 118 AD or CE, depending on what the current theory is and what I'm supposed to say, um, about 2,000 years ago. It was the largest dome spanning until 1946. Almost 2,000 years, it was the largest dome. Pretty cool, okay? What it is, is it's exactly 150 feet across and 150 feet tall. So you could fit a perfect ball, a perfect sphere inside of this building. So if we look at this building as a diagram, notice the circle that goes around. It's about the fact that we could put this ball or this sphere inside of this building and have it fit perfectly. So here we are walking into the building through the doors. That's where you got stuck. You didn't get to go in. Bummer, right? These doors are massive, way bigger than you're used to seeing. This is what it looks like from the outside. Not that impressive from the outside. Yeah, inside, different story. So here we are inside, and I'm going to flip back and, and make you note a few things. Notice the size of the people, okay? So if we look at this particular image here, come on, there we go. People, head height, eh, it's about there. See the column and see this first little uh, decorative ornament? Let's go to the drawing. Nope, got to go back, sorry. OK, there's the person right there. And there's that first little decorative piece. Look at how much more is above you. Right? It gives you a sense of scale. Like We're talking huge. Anyway, it's absolutely worth it. It should be on your bucket list. It's, it's amazing. Uh, just go in there. Do me a favor. Promise me right now when you go there, okay, when you go there, go sit in the building for like 30 minutes. Just sit there. I promise you it will be worth your while. Okay. It's awesome. You can like have a coffee and you know, whatever. Okay, so let's move on. Enough Pantheon talk. Sometimes it's, it's showing contrast. This is what something looks like in the day. This is what something looks like at night. This is what something looks like in one state. This is what something looks like in another state. So obviously you need two drawings to show that as part of it. Sometimes it's about using text. We talked about type and typography and fonts at length. You can do that in a diagrammatic form as well. Some people find this a really successful way of showing what's happening. So here we have uh, another Alex Holgraf example here. We've got a section cutting through the building, and instead of drawing little seats or little people doing what's happening in these various areas, he's put this ghosted text across the drawing that represents what's happening. This is what's happening in this area. This is what's happening in that area. And it's very successful. We can easily read it and understand what this building is about. So this is a diagram. It's not the real building. It's just showing us what's happening in the building. Another example here, using the text to identify where the stage would be. Another example here of that text. You've probably seen this one before. I think this is the um, Seattle Public Library, uh, the diagram of that. So you can see how these things come together. You're using text to identify what's happening. Is this the library? No. It's representative of the library. It tells us something about the library. Another example here, we have, we have the city, city horizon, regional horizon, and we have these little plus signs that are representing what's happening. So we're using text to identify something that's happening as part of the building. Movement through space over time. This is kind of overlapping with arrows. But you can see this as a series of streaks or a series of dots or a series of footprints. And I'm going to show you how to do this today in Illustrator as well. These are how people inhabit the space, how they move over time. Anybody know what this is? River. Hmm. OK, what if I told you that you have all been here? Bingo. Uh -huh. Right? So up, up top is Golden Gate Bridge. Right here, there's the Bay Bridge. 
What's right here? The airport, right? OK, so let's look at this as it develops over time. So this is a diagram of the city of San Francisco. And what this was a project done by the Exploratorium way back in 2010. So it's, it's old. Okay? But what they did is they took the GPS out of every taxi cab in San Francisco, and they started plotting the data of the taxi cabs. So is this a map of San Francisco? No. Is it a drawing of San Francisco? Not really. All it is is it's a map of the locations of all the taxi cabs in San Francisco. But we can really clearly see what's happening, especially as this elapses over time, if we switch, you know, go more than 24 hours, you start to see every street in San Francisco. You see all the major things. You see the airport. You see the Bay Bridge. And you see that the traffic on the Bay Bridge isn't as much. You see the Golden Gate, much less traffic on the, the Golden Gate, because the cabs don't go as cross it as often, probably because it's too expensive. But you get the idea. You can see Golden Gate Park. You can see all of these things start to materialize even though they're not really there. All we're seeing is dots of where the cabs are moving. But we see this as a diagram of the city of San Francisco. Pretty cool. So you can use this same technique to diagram how things move through space. And I actually use this as part of my thesis. These are a few of my thesis drawings. This had to do with flight paths above SFO, coming in and going out of the various runways at SFO, and how that uh, interacted with the city. I had to do the, my, my thesis had to do with the San Francisco airport. So this is SFO. This is the airport. These are how people moved through the airport, where they congregated. You can see the little switchback lines. This is back a ways. So it was before there were all the automated kiosks. It was when you had to get in the queue and wait for people to help you. Uh, also, at that time, Terminal 2, you know, where Virgin and stuff flies out of now, um, and I think American flies out of it now, that didn't exist. I mean, it was there, but nobody used it. It was just uh, boarded up, essentially. Uh, so that was, that's that big void on the right there. Um, so it was really only Terminal 1 and Terminal 3 as part of SFO. If you've flown out of there, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so this was a map, or this was a diagram of SFO and how people move through SFO, not SFO itself. So it's a diagram. And that's one of the key things about a diagram blown up a little bit. This was actually, I did it by hand, and then it translated into um, Illustrator later on. Maybe it's about views. As you go through a particular space to get to this pool at the end, the way the hallway bends, you can't see around the corners. Therefore, you're, you're private, even though there aren't any doors. In this particular example, it was about a site. This site is relative to a river with some trees. And this is the, that particular site. This one is a fun one. We were asked to diagram our thesis as we were leading into our thesis. So it was a two-sided card. We were given a little 4 by 6 card. So this, the first one, is what I thought my thesis was. And then I got into my thesis, and it became that. So it's about your thought process. It was a really fun one to do, because I really emphasize that circle, because that's where I was at that moment. Another example here, dotted lines, people moving through space, and how that ends up affecting the building itself. So same drawing uh, now with the new building involved. Series of diagrams here. Uh, these are more uh, environmental conditions where the sun's moving and that sort of thing. This one, yeah, the graphics are a little corny on this one. Uh, I think particularly the sun is, is really bad. Um, there might have been a, a more attractive way of representing it, but it's still very much about the space itself and what's happening in the space itself. Transformation. This is how we usually do something. What if we did it this way? So this is a two-part diagram. This is how it is. What if we do it this way? Typically, it's this. What if we did this? So two parts. Typically, it's this. What if we sliced it up and turned one part, and it became that? So it's about trans transition over time. OK, so that's it for the examples. I'm going to shift over uh, into Illustrator, and we're going to go through a bunch of techniques. Um, 
we're going to emphasize some of the stuff that you'll need for Charlie Harper. So hopefully you've worked on your Charlie Harper. You can use those techniques uh, for this. We're going to talk about brushes as part of the pen tool. So give me a second to switch over, and then we'll get started again. OK, so we're back in business. We appear to be working again. So I don't know why sometimes this stuff doesn't work. Um, today we're going to work through some architectural diagrams. And as part of, hey guys, I can't talk over all of you. I know I can talk loud, but I can't talk over everybody. Um, so uh, we're going to work through architectural diagrams today. And what I want you to work on is either pick a building that you like to diagram, or pick a building that you've done that's your own design and diagram that one. And so it's up to you. You guys are all at different places in your architectural career, so you may have a building that you could work on, you may not. Uh, for the sake of this particular um, assignment, I'm going to use the Kimball Art Museum because I think it's a really good one to see in section. Um, so if I, if I uh, do a Creative Commons image search, so search.creativecommons.org, Hopefully, I'll be able to see a Kimball Art Museum. But I might have to do just a plain Google image search. Actually, let me do that. Um, I just need a base for this. <coughs> Kimball Art Museum section. We'll start with that. Perfect. And so any one of these, yep. Louis Kahn, Kimball Art Museum. It's a really good one to, for, for me to use as part of a, a diagramming process here. Let me look for a little bit larger image. There you go. This one will work. And let me go ahead and save this image. And I'm going to save it uh, to my flash drives into today's folder. Uh, what are we on? 17. By the way, you guys are more than halfway through the semester, for whatever that's worth. So today is day 17 of 32. So pretty good. Uh, anyway, uh, it looks like I already have it here, but we'll, we'll override it. Yes, go ahead. All right, then I'm going to open up Illustrator. And what I, if you're going to pick an existing building, so Kimball Art Museum or, or the Pantheon or in, any building that works for you, um, we're going to not use the building itself, or at least we're going to make the building drawing really light, and we're going to concentrate on the diagramming part over the top of it. So I'm going to go ahead and go to File, and then New to create a brand new draw, drawing. It can be letter size. That's fine. It doesn't really matter uh, the size here. And then I'll go to File, and then Place, and I'm going to drop in that. Uh, image that I just saved. There it is. Uh, it's a lot bigger than I needed it to be, so let me go ahead and shrink it down. I'll use the free transform tool over here on the left to shrink this down. And I'm not really worried about the lower story of this. Um, I'm only worried about this one gallery and showing that one gallery. So let me shrink that down until it fits on the page. Yeah, about like that. That'll work. And then I'll press Control-0 to zoom back in so that I can see the drawing itself. And I'm going to work with this drawing uh, and actually draw over the top of it. Um, in order to not worry about selecting this, I'm going to create a brand new layer to do my diagram. So we'll call this Diagram 1. I'm going to use that as my layer to do the drawing. And I'm going to lock layer 1. I'll click the little lock button next to layer 1 so that I can't accidentally select or, or move that image as I start to work. So I'm going to work on diagram 1. And the first thing that I need to do is I need to actually trace kind of the key parts of the building. So in this particular example, um, let me go ahead and use an outline color of black so that you guys can see it here. And I'll trace over. We'll do it, and I'll do this rather quickly. You could spend a little bit more time doing this than I'm going to. Mm -hmm. 
and we can flip that and fill that in. It needs a little bit of adjustment. Let's pull that one out. This one should be converted to smooth. There we go. That one needs to be a little bit shorter. Anyway, we'll, we'll call that good enough as a trace. I'll do the same thing on this side. Luckily, the building is, is rather symmetrical. So I'll save myself a little bit of time by selecting this and then going to Edit, Copy, and then Edit, Paste. And then I will right click on the object and go to Transform and choose Reflect. It's going to be a vertical reflection. And then I can drag this one over to that point in the building. I'll use the arrow keys to adjust it a little bit. I probably need to draw the wall really quickly, so let me do the wall go like this. Something like that. So essentially what I'm trying to do is to create the major forms of the building. Um, looks like I probably need to do a little bit more over here. I'll simplify and just do a square there. And remember, I could use the Pathfinder tool to take these two pieces and join them together. So I'll use Pathfinder and join them together so they become one piece instead of two. So that Pathfinder tool should always kind of be there in the background just in case you need it. So now that I have this outlined, I could take my original drawing and turn it off altogether. And I'm seeing kind of basic key concept of Kimball Art Museum here. I could also choose to just take the drawing itself. Let me unlock it. I'll select it, and I can go to the opacity, and I could drop that opacity way down. So maybe it's just faint in the background. Well, I see it a little bit better than you. Let me adjust it a little bit more. Yeah, something like that. So there's a little bit of drawing in the background, but that's not the emphasis of this. Remember, a diagram is supposed to be simple. It's supposed to be about what's happening in this particular building. So in the Kimball Art Museum, it's known for having really great galleries uh, because of how the light enters the building. And so the top of every one of these galleries here, let me go back and lock the uh, layer here. The top of every one of these galleries has a little skylight, and then it has two little deflectors that come down, which essentially allows light to enter, sun, sunlight, natural sunlight, to enter this vault. But it gets reflected off the reflector and then reflected off the curving roof here, which provides a nice, even, ambient light for the building itself to showcase the artwork. So we have good natural daylight, but it's not directly on any of the paintings causing any, any fading or anything uh, inside the museum or any of the artifacts. So how do I show this in diagrammatic form? Well, first off, uh, I probably need to draw in the little reflector. So I'll do that just as a line here. So we'll go like that. Let me switch it so that it's just a line, and I'll thicken that line up a little bit. I'll do that over here in my stroke menu so it becomes a little bit thicker. I could copy that again, control C, control V, right click on it to reflect it. Again, it's vertical, and I could drop that particular piece in. I'm not going to worry about joining those together for right now. And essentially, I've gotten the, the key idea here behind the reflector, but I want to show this using some kind of a, a light or an arrow to show that this is, this is happening. So I'll do a new layer, and I'm doing this so that I can, you guys don't need multiple layers, but I'm going to do this in multiple ways so it helps to, to show it. Uh, I'm going to work on layer three now. And the first thing that I'll do is do it with an arrow. And so I could start with my pen tool. I could draw starting up top here as if I was the sun coming in. I could come down to where I hit the, the curve right about there. I could go back to where it bounces against the ceiling. And then I could go back down to where it's coming down to the wall, something like that. Now, in its current state, it's just the line and it looks like the background of the building. So the first thing that I could do is I could change the color of this particular line. So let me come over to the stroke color. I'll double click, and I'll pick a yellow color, something like that, to represent that that is, in fact, the sun coming in. Maybe I want to put an arrow on the end. And so I could come in and actually draw an arrow for the end. Or 
Let me back up two steps. Illustrator has the ability to select the line, and then if I come over to the stroke menu here, at the bottom, there's something called arrowheads. And it's an arrowhead at the start or the arrowhead at the end. In my case, I started up top here, so I don't want it at the start. I want the arrowhead at the end. I can click on this, and you can see that there's a bunch of different styled arrows that can go in place. Now, some of them might end up being a little heavy-handed. So that, that's you know, a little bit big and maybe not the most attractive thing in the world. But as we continue scrolling down here, some of these other ones look reasonable. Right? That's not a bad one. They have some corniness uh, available. So you could come down here and you know, do the, the pointer finger or something. I don't think I'd recommend that for an architectural diagram. But uh, I at least wanted to point out that they are, they are there as well. So let me come back up. I like this arrow 11. That's about the right proportions for what I'm after. My current weight is 5 point. Recognize that I could change that to make it thicker if I wanted to. I could also change it to make it thinner if I wanted to. I could type in a value if I didn't want to jump by full point value increments as part of this. So there I have the most basic form uh, of an arrow. So that would be one way of showing it. You do have the ability to put an end on the arrow. You saw in here that some of these had ends on them, so I could put an end on it if I wanted to. Generally speaking, you don't. The other thing that can happen, I'll go back up to none, is that this, the arrow itself might be too large for what you're trying to create. You can adjust the scale by a percentage point. So if I didn't like this arrow at 100%, I could do a smaller arrow, and I could drop it to maybe 50%, and my arrow's going to get a little bit smaller. Notice, though, when I do that, that the thickness of the line doesn't match the arrow anymore. So that might be something that, that causes you to, to not want to do it. Remember, you can, of course, always uh, draw the arrow by hand. And when we start to use brushes, you may end up finding that you need to do that. So that's its most basic form. Now, maybe instead of doing this as just a basic arrow, I'd instead like to do it where it looks a little bit more like I drew it. And so I'll do the same line. We'll start here. We'll go down. We'll reflect. And we'll come down on the wall there. And this time, instead of doing it um, as, a, uh, as a basic arrow, I'm going to come up to this little icon here that looks like a cup, like you would sit on your desk with a bunch of brushes in it. The brushes in Illustrator allow us to uh, make specialized looking lines. And there are a few default lines that are available to you that you may have, but there's also a bunch more that you can load. So if I click the little flyout menu, the triangle with the three lines here, I can go to Open Brush Library. This is a lot like the swatches. And there's a bunch of other types of brushes that are available for you. So let me go into Artistic, for example. And when I'm in Artistic, let's do a chalk, charcoal, or pencil brush. And we can now see that there's a bunch of different brush lines that I could use on here, as if I were drawing it by hand. So for example, here's a charcoal pencil. And my line changes. Let me uh, tell you what. Let me make this uh, a little bit bigger so you can see it. And I'm going to change, even though the sun is probably not red. Well, actually, today with the smoke, it might be more red. So I'm going to change this just so you can see it to a little bit more red, just because it'll stand out more for, for the projector. Okay. So. I could change this to have any one of these line types associated with it. And I can work through and try a bunch of them. And they're designed to mimic as if you drew it by hand. So maybe something like that, for example. Now, when you draw it, you also might have to draw the arrowhead in this instance. So let me draw the arrowhead like that. And I will apply the stroke to that, or the brush to that as well. It may involve a little bit of tweaking here. But you guys get the idea. So this looks a little bit more like a hand sketch as opposed to just the generic computer arrow. Um, when you have a brush applied, if you apply one of the arrowheads to it, it's just the same arrowhead. It doesn't have a special brushed arrowhead. So if I went to the one that I was using, the brush arrow 11, it just looks like a normal uh, brush head here. It just looks like that. So it doesn't always turn out the most attractive. 
Um, so in this instance, I think it's better to draw your own arrowhead if you're going to use one of the brushes. Sometimes you want one of the thicker ones, or maybe you want a watercolor brush, for example. So I could draw it on the other side here, reflecting this way, different time of day maybe, like that. I can go into my brushes here, oops, sorry, and we could load the open brush library. We'll go into artistic. I could load in the watercolor, for example. The only challenges with the watercolor is sometimes they appear too light. Let's see here. And or too big. So in this case, I need to shrink the size down a little bit. So they look a little bit more like watercolor. Notice that they do have some transparency in them. So I can see it a little bit better than you can. Um, one of the challenges here is obviously that they're lighter. There you go, something like that. That's designed to mimic as if you did it with a paintbrush. So there's a lot of flexibility in these various brushes. And what I want you to do as part of your exercise today is load up a bunch of brushes and try them out and see what works and what doesn't, what looks good and what doesn't. They, you know, of course, I have my favorites. I have the ones I tend to use if I'm going to use one of these brushes. But it doesn't mean it has to be your favorite, which is why I'm not saying use this particular one. I want you to experiment with them. Feel free to also go in and load even more. Um, explore some of the other categories. Um, there's a bristle brush library, for example, uh, that looks a little bit more like multiple strokes overlapping each other. Um, you, can, you can see how these various things uh, play out. And the point is that I want you to try out a bunch of these until you find that, oh, I do like this particular one. And I don't know which one that's going to be. So go ahead and keep loading these and, and play around with them as you go forward. Now maybe instead of doing this as a line, we want to show it in a different way. So I've shown it as, as lines for right now and arrows. Maybe we want to do a color code on this. Maybe we want to show it as if there's a flood of light coming up here, and it fades as it goes down. So in this case, I would draw, using the pen tool, a void in here that would represent the light coming in. So I'd come along here, and I, I could be a little bit more accurate, but I'm just trying to get the, the idea across here. So excuse my inaccuracies as I trace. Okay. Okay, so I've created this shape. I could flip it and I could fill that shape with a yellow. So let me go back to where I have some yellow here. I can fill that shape with yellow. That's showing that it's the light's coming in, but it's pretty heavy-handed still. So maybe instead I'll add a gradient to this. So we'll do a linear gradient if it'll let me. No, I didn't want orange to yellow. Start at yellow on one side. On this side here, I want the opacity to go to zero, so it ends up being transparent. My linear gradient, I want the rotation here to be at 90, so that it's coming down from the top, not from the side. It's coming down from the top. The placement of these sliders control how much of it is opaque before it goes transparent. So I could do something like this, where it's a color region that's flowing through that particular space and showing that the, the gradient of light is coming in. If I was more accurate, this would look a little bit better, because it wouldn't have the white uh, spots on either side. But this is a way of showing it. I could, I could instead take this yellow and say, you know what, that needs to have a little transparency to it, too. So we'll maybe make that at 80%. So it has a little bit of transparency, and then it gets completely transparent. The placement of these sliders has to do with where the transition occurs. So if I were to raise this up, oops, it helps if you select it. If I were to raise this up, you can see that that transparency changes. Let me lower it down, and let me also change this so it's a little bit more transparent like that. So this is another way of doing it, where you have a radiant or, or, or a gradient um, showing. Maybe you want to show that there's some heat at the bottom of the building. Maybe there's radiant floor heating. I have no idea if this, if this building has it. But maybe you would do the same kind of a gradient. 
Let me switch to, uh, let's see, is it 180? No. 270. Why didn't 270 work? No, apparently not. Maybe I have to go back to zero. Zero, 90, 135, that's what it is. No, what? I can't win. Well, you want to go from the, the bottom up? Yeah. Oh, you could just do like zero. Negative 90. How about negative 90? <laughs> Sorry, I was going too far. It'll only let me go to 180. OK, so there it is. But this time I want there, instead of having the yellow, I want it to be red at the bottom to represent the, the radiant floor, for example. And maybe I want it to be you know, less showing, something like that. It shows that there's something happening there. So it's another way of diagramming. There's not a right or a wrong answer for these. So I'm not asking you to be accurate with the building. I'm asking you to explore these ideas. I want you to start to be comfortable with these ideas. So that's doing a gradient. So we did brushes, we did arrows, we did gradients. Now maybe we're going to go and I'll do a plan next so that we can show you a few of the other uh, strategies for like color coding and, and what have you. So let me go ahead and create a new uh, drawing. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to bring in, I'll go to file and then place, and I'm going to bring in a plan. Let's make that plan a little bit bigger here. I'll go to the free transform menu. All right, sounds good. I don't need, I don't need the other half of this. I'm just going to work on the upper part of this here. And I want to be able to color code this building. I want to color code what's happening in various pieces of this particular building. So I have a couple things that I can do uh, relating to color coding this building. Uh, and this is going to dovetail in nicely with the things that you're probably doing for Charlie Harper. Okay? So first off here, I'll create a new layer. I'll lock the first layer so that I can't accidentally edit it. And I'm going to work on layer two. So in order to get started, I really need to have some tracing done of this particular building. And so I can come in and I could use the pen tool. And I could draw over the top of this building. So I could say, OK, let's do there to there. Let me switch these so it's an outline. There we go. OK, so I've traced over that. If I were to turn this one off so you can see my outline, I have just the outline of the building. I need a few more lines to kind of divide these up. Now, it's a lot of work to go in and, and trace over all of these lines perfectly. I could do it. But I could also just use the line tool and draw some major lines that kind of overlap things. So I'll draw a line there. And we'll draw another line that goes across here. And it looks like it only goes to right about there. Remember, if I hold down Shift, It'll make it a little bit easier for me to draw. So we'll draw here. I'm not worried about being super accurate when I'm drawing these drawing these lines um, from where they start and where they end. I want them to line up where the, the, the lines go. But I'm not worried about being overly accurate. Right. So we're going over it like that, over that. That's fine. I need a couple more diagrams here. We'll go there. Right. I could even do these with squares if I wanted to. OK, so now if I were to turn off, and again, I'm rushing a little bit. You'll take a little bit more time. If I were to turn off the image here, we would see away, that I've kind of identified where some of the key pieces are as part of this, this drawing. I can turn it back on, and we can see it a little bit more. Yeah, not bad. It looks like I need a line that's right here. I need a line that's right there. Maybe there's a line that comes down there. And maybe this has a few little dividing lines here. All 
OK, so let me turn off. And now we're back to where I have just these kind of lines overlapping. I want to make sure that all of these lines do, in fact, overlap. It looks like there's a few lines that really need to be adjusted. So I'll make a few adjustments, make sure that this overlaps here, like that. So I'm making sure that these overlap. Now, what I'd really like to be able to do is I'd like to fill in certain regions with color. You know, Maybe this region is one color, this region is another color, et cetera. I can do this using something called a live paint tool. It's kind of like the paint bucket tool in Photoshop, but it's meant for um, Illustrator and line drawings. And so in order to do that, I need closed in regions. So when I was creating this, I was careful to make sure that I created closed in regions on all of these pieces. And the other thing that's useful when you do this is to always make a duplicate of the layer that you're going to do the live paint on. So before I do anything, I have my lines. I'm going to duplicate layer two. I'll go to the little fly out menu, say duplicate layer two. I'll rename this to be Live Paint. And I could even say it's Live Paint 1 in case I was going to do multiple live paints. Now that I'm on that layer, we'll turn off my layer 2 so that we can come back to it later. And I'll select all of the objects that are on the Live Paint 1 layer. I should do it with the black arrow, the regular selection tool. There are all my objects. I'll go up to Object, and then Live Paint, and then Make. And so live paint and then make will make a live paint group. When I've made the live paint group, I can then go in to the live paint tool, which is available under the shape builder tool. It's under the, the tool with the two circles on it. It looks like a paint bucket. It's called the live paint tool. You can also press K on the keyboard to get there without having to find it. Once I have that, you'll see that as I hover over my object, Illustrator recognizes all of the closed in regions. So anything that's been enclosed. And it highlights them with that little pinkish color. I can then choose a particular color. So let me flip my colors and let me choose a color, say uh, blue here, for example. And when I hover my mouse over this and I paint, it's going to fill in that region in blue. I could then change my color to be some other color. And I could fill in those in a different color. Maybe I change my color again. And remember, I probably should have picked my colors ahead of time so that I had color theory in my favor. Uh, but let's say that this and this and this are different and that. And then I'll pick one last color. And again, I don't know that this necessarily corresponds to anything. I'm just showing the, the skill here. Once I've done this, these objects are still part of what's called the Live Paint group. So remember, I made that Live Paint group. It's identified by this special little uh, border with the little stars in the corners. That Live Paint group keeps everything together. In order to access any one of these shapes on an individual basis, I need to click this button for Expand. And what that does is it breaks it out of the live paint group and gives me the individual objects. I can now use the direct select tool, the white arrow, and I can select individual objects. Or I can use the select menu to select same fill color, and I'll get all of the orange objects, for example. In this context, I think it would be best to show the original plan. So if I turn the original plan back on, but to adjust the opacity of these layers. So with those objects selected, I'll come in here and I'll adjust the opacity so that we can see the building underneath it. I will also turn off, uh, let me move my color regions onto a new layer. So let me call these color regions. I'll move them up there so that I can turn off my line drawings and have just the colored regions over the top of my plan. If I wanted more of those color regions to show up, maybe I want to show the blue. I could select the blue. I can move that to the color regions layer. And ultimately, I can turn things off. This blue also needs its um, opacity adjusted. So we'll drop that down as well so that we can see through. So it's really easy to do these color coding things using a live paint tool. The key on the live paint tool is that you make sure that all of your lines cross, or at least they meet. 
Where you'll have trouble with the live paint tool is if you have something, let me flip this for just a second, and I have a line that comes really close but doesn't quite intersect, and I go to do the live paint, object, live paint, make. Then I go to the Live Paint tool and I go to Paint. Oh wait, it's not, it's not letting me do it because they don't intersect. I have to make sure that they intersect. So I could come in here and I could adjust that to make sure that they intersect. When I go back to the Live Paint tool, now it's registering those as two separate regions that I could fill. Make sure also, this is the other key to Live Paint. It's pretty easy to work with. Make the duplicate layer before you do the Live Paint. Make sure you duplicate the layer. Because there will come a point where you're unhappy with it or something didn't go right and you want to go back to where you had your original lines. Once you make the live paint group, they're in the live paint group and you have to go through and release them and it's a really big pain. So go back and just make a duplicate of the layer. Um, it also long term allows you to, for example, I could turn back on this original layer with my overlapping lines and we make it on top of everything else. I could select all of the lines on that layer and I could apply some sketchy edges to them or something. Uh, let me go into my brushes. I could apply a brush stroke to them and I could then show this without the plan but still have an idea and it's a much more casual idea about what was going on in the building. It's just a different style. Because I have the lines, I can do this. If I didn't have the lines, if I didn't have the duplicate layer, I couldn't do it. So it's another way of kind of looking at this and deciding what works. Just because these have the brush strokes applied to them doesn't mean that it, the, the, the live paint wouldn't recognize the regions. It still would recognize the regions in all likelihood. So when you change all the lines, you just grab the whole layer and then change it? Right. So it, I, I wanted to select all of the lines. And to do that, there's a couple different ways of doing it. If I selected one of the lines, so here I select one line, I could go up to the Select menu and say Select Same Stroke Color, which would give me all the black lines. The other option over here would be to come over and where the little boxes, they aren't there right now, but that represent your objects. If you click here on the layer, it will so then select all of the objects that are on that particular layer. If I were to expand the layer, we could see there's all the paths that I created, and there they all are as selected. So just another way of doing a selection. So that's the Live Paint tool. The one other thing that I want to introduce to you today so that you're aware of it, it doesn't always work seamlessly. Uh, and that is something called image trace. And I apologize, I have to make a, a correction on the, the website and I will probably say this during lecture as well. Illustrator has changed what they used to call live trace. So there was live paint and there was live trace. Now live trace is called image trace. And I'm still adjusting my brain to the fact that they changed the terminology. Uh, but essentially what that does is it allows us to take an image and this plan might not be the best image to do it with because it's not that high of resolution. Let me, uh, let me try loading in a different image and see if I can do this a little bit better. Let me go to, uh, file and then place and I'll see if I can load in like this Pantheon plan. Maybe that'll work a little. No, that one's not good. <coughs> doesn't show up. All right, that's a problem. Um, well, I guess we'll do it with the uh, we'll do it with the art museum instead. Let me unlock it. And essentially what I can do is I can select the image. And this takes a bitmap image, so an image that came from Photoshop or whatever, a JPEG that doesn't have actual lines, and it looks at it as if you were trying to trace over the image. So you got a t sheet of tracing paper out and you were going to trace over the lines themselves. That's what this does. I'm going to select the object. I'm going to go up to, um, sorry, object, image, trace, make. And you see that it, it, it kind of abstracted the plan a little bit because it tried to trace through and make objects out of this. If I go into my presets up here across the top, I can go through a bunch of different examples. So depending on what you're trying to trace, some of these will look better than others. Let me try line art, for example. 
give it a second to process and see if it gets any better. Okay? Not too much better. I could go in and I could say, how about we did a technical drawing? Mm, not that much better. How about if we did sketched art? All right, that was kind of like the first one. Shades of gray. Okay, that one has some, some gray shades in it. I could do three colors. See what happens here. You kind of have to go through the various options. I'm going to leave it here as three colors, uh, but I am going to click on this little button next to my preset because I want to check the box to ignore white. So it's right here, ignore white. That won't create white objects. It'll leave those transparent. So I'll click on ignore white. And when I'm done, I'll go ahead and click the expand button. So just like the live paint, at the end you click the expand button. And what Illustrator just did is it took the JPEG image that I loaded in, traced over it with lines, and now I could go in with my direct select tool and I could select any one of these lines and start to manipulate those lines. Or any of these colored regions, I could select them and manipulate them. So this colored region, for example, I could say, you know what, I wanted it to be red. Sorry, it's not in. There we go. I wanted it to be red or something like that. So that's what the image trace allows you to do. It works sometimes. It doesn't work other times. But I at least wanted to introduce it to you as a concept so that you were aware that it existed in case you wanted to kind of play around with it a little bit. So that's image trace. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to go through. Oh, I know, I know the other thing I wanted to do. I wanted to talk about making a brush in the first place. So let me, the image trace, if I take an image, I'm going to go to object, image trace, and then make. So one more thing that I didn't go through just yet is sometimes you want to make a custom brush to represent what's going on. So let's say that I wanted to show how somebody walks through this particular space. So I could do that. Let me zoom in a little bit. I could do that by drawing a line that goes through the space. So I could say, OK, that's where I'm going to start. And I'm going to work my way through here. And they walk around here. And they come back. And they walk over here. And they walk through this gallery. And then they go back. Let me flip it so that it's just a line. And then they come back here. And then they continue back over here. And they do a quick visit into this gallery. And then they were done, so they go back out the door. So something like that. I could just do multiple versions of this line and trace people as they go through the building. So I could do another version. And this time, the person comes in and said, no, I really wanted to see you over here. And you know what? I work here, so I'm going to visit this particular office and maybe spend a little bit of time in this office, maybe a little bit more time. And then I'm going to work my way back out. And I need to take an early lunch, so I'm out of here. Whatever. You can, you can invent these stories as you go through it. And at some point, you get a really nice density to these lines of how people are moving through the space. Maybe the lines themselves are a little bit dark or heavy-handed in this context. I could go in to my stroke again. And I could choose to have it as a dashed line. So I can check the box here for dashed line. And I could specify what my distance is. So in this case, it's 12 point. Maybe I want it to be a little bit finer. Uh, maybe instead of 12 point, we do a 2 point. So it's much closer together. But I can also choose what my gap is. Maybe I want only a 1 point gap so they're closer together. I don't know. I could do that to both of these. So we could say I want it to be dashed, 2 point, 1 point. And now there are more dots going through the space. I could also do it as a one point, one point, which would be little squares. One point, one point. Sorry, leave it. Um, as I go through, as a way of kind of identifying what's happening. But sometimes you want to be a little bit more clever in how you create this stuff. So what I'm going to show you how to do is to create a custom brush that represents, say, a footprint. So I'll start by drawing up the footprint. So let me come up here, and I'm going to draw a little footprint. So let's say, let's 
There's one print. Let me flip it so that we see it as a color. Oops. All right, so there's a footprint. I can take this footprint, let me copy it, paste it, and then I'm going to reflect it. This time it's going to be horizontal. And I'll place the other part of the footprint, maybe like that. So I've drawn those two little footprints. But I want them to become a brush that would apply to my line. So if I select these two objects, and they can be any object that you want, I can go up to my brushes. And I can actually drag these objects onto the brush window. So when I do that, like this, it's going to say, do you want to create a new brush? Yes, I do. And it's going to be a scatter brush. That's the kind of brush I want. I'll go ahead and say OK. And we'll call this footprints. Do I want the size to be fixed? In this case, I do want the size to be fixed. Do I want the spacing to be fixed? Yes, I do. Do I want the scatter? Do I want random footprints? No, it can be fixed as well. Do I want the rotation? No, I want the rotation to, well, we'll leave it as fixed. But I want it relative to the path, not to the page. So there it is as footprints. I'll go ahead and say OK. And it shows up here as one of my brushes. Now if I were to take one of these lines, we'll say that line for example, and click on the footprints, it changes to be footprints. Now, these are a little bit too big, so let me go back in and adjust the size down. So we could, we could find whatever the right size is. And now I have the little footprints going through the building rather than the, uh, the dotted line. So I could switch this one over into the footprints as well. Again, I need to adjust the size down. Right, exactly. You could make several different versions of this. You could make dog footprints. You could, I mean, you can get creative with the idea. So you can be, you know, obviously this is, this is about teaching you the general idea. I could do this with any kind of object. If I didn't like the footprints, I could do it with little circles, for example. So I could, I could create a couple little circles. You know, something like that. I could take those two. I'll drag them to the brush window here. And yes, I want them to be a scatter brush. Default options are fine. I want it relative to the path, although they're circles, so it doesn't really matter. I'll say OK. Now I have circles, and I could take one of these and make it circles as they went through. Okay, It depends on what you're kind of after as, as part of this. In the same context, this doesn't have to do with uh, the plan anymore, but I could do this um, using something like birds or bats or whatever uh, as they're flying through an object. So let me show you an example here. Um, I guess it's close to Halloween, so maybe I should draw a bat really quick. So bear with me for a second while we draw a bat. OK, so let's say I created the little bat. It's close to Halloween. It's a little corny, but you get the idea. I'll take this, and I'll drag it in same way that I did it with the, uh, with the rest of it. I'm going to do a scatter brush, but this time I'm going to change some options. So here, along this line, I don't want the size to be fixed anymore. I want the size to be random. And we can change how much the size can change. So it can change from 10% to 100% in this example. I want the spacing to also be random. It can change from 10% to 100%.
The scatter, let's make that random as well. So that's going to change. I do need to make the percentages different. So let's go a little bit on both sides. And the rotation, let's make that random as well. Like that. I'll go ahead and say OK. And now if I create a curve, and again, this doesn't have to do with plan so much, like that, and I apply the bats to this, make sure it doesn't have this, and let me make sure that they're smaller here. Oops. Sorry, my size is always too big here. You can see that it randomly will scatter the bats across the path with different sizes. I can increase, let me go into my brushes, and I could change this a little bit. And I could say that I want my size to be so that some can get really large. And now I have, well, there's too many, but I'm, some are getting big, some are getting small. So you get the idea. If this was spread out a little bit more, you'd see it. Let me see if I can shrink the size down. Yeah, there's a lot of bats there. Anyway, you get the idea. Okay, so you can adjust that and how many are there. Maybe this needs to change its size the opposite way. Maybe I need to go to 1.Z now. I think my density is a little too high. Yeah, well, the idea is that some get big or some get small. So you can use this to scatter objects as well. So it's, it's called a scatter brush. So it's really hard because there's lots of little things that I could continue going on and going off on tangents. But I want you to concentrate on these basic ideas as you go through and diagram. Uh, looks like you only have about an hour left to do this because I talked too long today. Uh, but such is life. You should comment on this exercise. And hopefully the live uh, paint will help you on your Charlie Harper. Next class, we're actually going to switch out of Illustrator. So you're on your own for the rest of the Charlie Harper. We're not going to do any more Illustrator. We're going to go into AutoCAD for a while. It's OK. Don't worry. Don't worry. I'm assuming that none of you have ever touched AutoCAD before. If you've touched it before, it makes it easy. But if you haven't, don't worry. I'll get you there. Uh, but we will come back to Illustrator. So you can't forget all the Illustrator stuff. We will be back in Illustrator um, before the end. OK, so I'll turn you loose. What's Illustrator? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>